Right. No, and I don't have any place to store it right now. No, but I have, I still need to reach out to, um, I still need to reach out to uh, that did apply. Right. No, and I don't have any place to store it right now. Um, I can't ask the results, show me who's watching. Speaking of, we are live on YouTube. We're going to go ahead and get started then. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome everyone to come who came tonight and those who are going to if you're watching this after the fact, thank you for finding us. We've got our videos for very I am Leanne Susan, Executive Director. Um, and we're super excited about this month's talk. Liberty High Bailey was a really brilliant horticultural botanist out of South Haven. And we have reached out to the South, excuse me, the Liberty High Bailey Museum and Garden has so generous to talk about um, Bailey's. Um, contributions to the plant sciences. Uh, before we get started and bring Dr. Bailey in, I have a few announcements to make. Uh, please don't forget that tomorrow is the last day for artisans to register for our art fair here at the end of the month. If you want to attend our artisan fair, it is September 24th and 25th. We have several different kinds showing up from woodworking to chain mail to quilting and everything in between. Um, we are also excited that we have our signature event coming up. Please, please, please buy your tickets. No tickets at the door. Last day for ticket sales is October 4th. Don't sit on it. Otherwise, you will miss the purchase date if you don't want to do that. Tickets are $50 per person or $450 per table of 10. And you can purchase them online at fairyandhistory.org or call us at 269-471-1222. We'll get you hooked up over the phone. If you want to meet in person, stop on by. We're open Wednesday through Sunday, 10 to 5. Um, next month, uh, past up to the past, is actually we're going to be here. We're going to be at Rose Hill Cemetery. We're going to be doing a symbolic tour of the cemetery. We're going about the symbols that can be found in the tombstones and their names. People usually say, what does this mean? What does that mean? And now's your chance to learn. 6.30 at Rose Hill here in Varian Springs. Um, that one will not be live streamed due to the fact that we're outside. I didn't. I have a live stream. It will be the presenter, so you won't be able to do that. So you better show up if you want to hear it. And then we already have registration open for our Fireside Tales. We're working in partnering with Twin City Players to bring in ghost stories in the cabin on October 1st, 15th, and 29th at 7.30. $5 per person or $2 if you're a member. We have a special kid-friendly version for our little, little friends. We'll be roasting marshmallows in the cabin uh, fireplace. We'll have some apple cider and have some fun Halloween stories safe for kids. Two o'clock on the 16th. Registration is required. Varyandhistory.org backslash programs. You'll be able to sign up to the link there. Added last minute, we're working with Mary City of David to provide a couple of programs, including a tour on the 24th, or not, excuse me, a talk on the 24th. 100 years of myth debunked. $10 per person. Proceeds go to help the mission and preservation of Mary City of David and CJ. And we have three fall tours, October 8th, 15th, and 22nd. Limited spaces, only 12 per tour. Those are $20 per person for about an hour and a half. A lot of walking, indoor, outdoors, so keep that in mind. And that can also be registered online. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to us at info at fairyhistory.org. Or you can call us at the phone number for you to be listed. We'd be happy to help you. So if you're not here, listen to me. You're here to see our wonderful talk. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And then Mr. Bailey will join us. Excuse me, Dr. Bailey will join us. Thank you. Thank 
Walking on campus at Michigan State, you will run across a residence hall called the Liberty High Bailey Hall, with signage identifying the structure. This is the dorm for the Bailey Scholars Program, a residential initiative for the study of the environment. Next door is the Bailey Greenhouse, an urban farm, growing organic and healthy produce for consumption on campus. A short walk away, you can find the Eustace Coal Hall, the first horticultural laboratory building in the country, designed by Bailey, built in 1888. Who is this man named Liberty High Bailey? In the gardens nearby is a statue of Liberty High Bailey. Why is there a statue of him on campus here at Michigan State? A residence hall and a greenhouse and a famous building he designed. A student from 1877, a professor here from 1885 to 1889, what did he do to earn such honor and reverence? How did he become such a significant person on campus? And what made him a globally famous horticulturist and the father of modern horticulture? The plaque at the statue reads, a native of South Haven, Michigan. Let's take a trip back in time and westward in Michigan, west from Lansing to the crystal blue waters of Lake Michigan. Travel inland at South Haven's iconic lighthouse, past the 1850s bustling Black River Harbor front to an old farmhouse and small forest about a mile inland. This is the birthplace of Liberty High Bailey Jr. The house was built in 1855 by his father, Bailey Sr. Bailey Sr. and his wife, Sarah, moved to South Haven in 1856 from Bangor, two years before our Bailey Jr. was born in 1858 in this Greek revival country home. Bailey Jr. was the third son for the Baileys. Bailey's birth home and homestead is now known as the Bailey Museum and Gardens. It is a national historic landmark and a Michigan historic site. For many years, the Bailey Homestead and Orchards were very prolific, highly awarded with formal accolades for their fruit production for sale, and they grew everything they needed and more. Grains, cattle, sheep, chickens, and of course, their famous apples and peaches. After many years and several owners and property sales, in 1938, the remaining parcel of the birth homestead and acreage was purchased by a four-sided benefactor. The home was donated to the city of South Haven in 1938 by Mrs. Clifton Charles, while Bailey was still living in New York. Her late husband, Clifton Charles, had been a great friend and roommate of young Bailey at college, and Mrs. Charles gifted the home and land and required that the house be preserved to honor Liberty Hyde Bailey, who by 1938 was world renowned for his work in horticulture, the contributions globally, and was very famous, revered, and had earned the respected title of the father of modern horticulture. On September 4, 1938, a formal dedication ceremony was held on the West Port. Bailey was unable to attend the ceremony, although he did send a telegraph stating, I trust the gift will freshen old memories, yield satisfaction to the people, and stimulate youth. Bailey was an early student of the outdoors. He advocated youth education and the museum continues his legacy with its Bailey Budding Naturalist Summer Program. Bailey is also credited with creating the 4-H youth program still in practice across the country today. The house was used as a rental hostel, then a nurse's dormitory. In the 1950s, a group of concerned and committed citizens with the mayor formed the Liberty Hyde Bailey Park Museum. In 2019, the Board of Trustees modified the name to the Liberty Hyde Bailey Museum and Gardens to incorporate the remaining two acres of the primordial forest and the maintained gardens, preserving Bailey's love of nature and his philosophy, all embodied in his famous book, The Holy Earth, published in 1915. Let's return to Liberty Hyde Bailey for the moment and explore how this place that he was born into 
1858 South Haven, shaped and molded him to become the outstanding person that he grew into and continued to be the age of 96. It is a truly remarkable and wonderful story. Let's explore and go inside. Early in Young Bailey. Look, you go inside. I am Dr. Liberty Hyde Bailey, and I'm glad to be here. And I hope the introduction to where I came from and where I ended up in East Lansing was informative as a background. I'm happy to be here in Bear Berrien County. And you'll learn more, but Berrien County has a thriving agriculture, fruit, and phenology uh, wine industry growing here. And so much of that came from my work in my youth and my working years. Uh, you've heard a little bit about the history there and the house being built. Some of the details about that had to do with my mother and father, and I go first person because it's easier and I think more effective. My mother and father had a 40 acre homestead in Bangor, Michigan, which is about 10 miles east of South Haven. They homesteaded that when they moved from Vermont and they bought this small parcel of 40 acres and started to grow people. Father learned that number one, being at the lake would be better for fruit growing. Number two, he saw all the ships leaving South Haven in that harbor you just saw going to Illinois and said, wow, we can ship more fruit fresh if we grow it here and it'll be a better product. So back in 1854, they bought a parcel of 80 acres in South Haven you come to the museum, I think my mother said something like, oh my gosh, here we go again. Uh, having to go and clear 80 acres of uh, mature forests to put in orchards. That was all before I was born. Luckily, I didn't have to clear the 80 acres. However, it was tough. Uh, you saw the pictures of the house that I was born in, which is now our museum. You're welcome to come join. And it's a lovely, homestead turned museum with two acres of the woods that was mentioned there from remaining from the 80 acres that father purchased back in uh, 1854. I was very fortunate. I was born in that house in 1858 and I grew up in an area of nature with fruit growing and grass growing and uh, crops growing because of the 80 acres, my father divided it into 40 acres of fruit, apples and peaches, and then into 40 acres of row crops to feed the cattle, to feed the sheep because they produced everything on site that they needed back in 1858 and beyond. Any excess, especially the fruit, of course, was shipped and paid you know, sold, which added to father's prosperity. When you look at that house that you saw earlier and come to the museum, it was one of the most significant homes constructed in that period in South Haven out of the downtown area. There were other buildings built before that. However, they were more, like, more brick buildings and hotels and things during the boom, early boom years of South Haven. So we're very fortunate that it was preserved. You heard in a brief um, moment there that the house and the last two acres were purchased by the widow of my college roommate. So the gentleman that I shared a lot of time with at college, we'll get there in a minute. His widow had the foresight to buy the last two acres in the home and dedicated as a museum. So we can get back to that story. If we go back a little bit into time. So I was born in one of the rooms in the house and, and there's a cradle that I slept in. It's currently bare wood, but I think I had cushions when I was young. Um, 
There's other artifacts and poems, but the other sad part is when I was four years old, my mother died in the same room and it affected me traumatically. That's many of you may have experienced yourself. I developed a speech impediment. The good news is two things. One, my young, when I was young, my mother taught me about gardening and she taught me about working in the dirt outside of the house before I was four years old. That's where I learned to get dirt under my nails. It's not a bad thing. Later, after she passed, my father, sometime thereafter, married again, uh, happened to marry the housekeeper who was taking care of the house, which was apparently I've learned quite common in 1862. Um, and she was extremely supportive of my memory of my mother. We continued to garden. She helped support me. And it was a lovely transition to my stepmother. Um, as I continued to grow older, we were also blessed that the indigenous Potawatomis were in the region on West Michigan. And my father, as a gracious, gracious person, allowed them to encamp on the property twice a year as they migrated with the seasons. I was fortunate enough to grow up with the young Potawatomi Braves who taught me fundamentals that impacted me for life. They taught me the respect of the earth, respect for the water, respect for the wildlife, and they instilled in me the concept that protect the earth, protect the water, harvest only what you're going to eat, and then they'll all take care of you in the future. Unfortunately, today we're faced with challenges that reflect people aren't practicing those uh, stewardship issues. So with the Potawatomi, um, we have a little uh, diorama in the museum reflecting their influence. They got my parents and the Potawatomi chieftains and wives um, often came to the house to learn the white people's way. And my parents also were invited to the Potawatomi encampment to learn the Potawatomi ways. And that, I think, added an awful lot to the breadth of my vision of the world and how we can go forward and try to make it sustainable and um, collaborative. From there, I went to school in South Haven, about a mile away from our house. I had a lunchbox that weighs about five pounds. It was a bit by a foot, like eight inches, quite heavy. And that's before food was put into it. Uh, but you know, it's easy to carry until you put the books on your back. So uh, often we host the kids from school, if all third graders come through, we pull it out of the cabinet. Oh, that's nothing. Well, if it's a mile away and the snow's deep, it's a little more than nothing. And the kids appreciate that uh, correlation. So and that's one of the great, contributions we give to the kids in South Haven is they all get to come through on the day with Dr. Bailey and at the museum. And from there, after uh, several experiences harvesting snakes that my stepmother found in the oven because I was hatching eggs or turtles that were in the bath area, um, she understood that I had a great love of nature. And she was an advocate for continuing education and helped convince my father, who was very devout and strict. He also was a founding member of the Masonic Temple in South Cape. Called it's, the lodge is the Star of the Lake Lodge, which is still there today. Beautiful building. First time I saw my father's picture when I came back, somebody 
at a meeting there, introduced me to it, and there's a six foot picture of my father's portrait in the stairwell at the Masonic Temple. And when you see it, maybe there was one in the full of video. Um, he did not look like a warm and loving person, but he was loving and compassionate in spite of his demeanor. So it, uh, it was great to grow up with him and mom because they taught very fundamental principles. Later, they may have strayed from some of their strict curriculum. However, I am still a believer in certain religious ethics. When I, let's see, uh, there was an occasion in my youth that I went to Chicago unannounced with the mom and dad. And that's quite another story. And you can find it in research with a buddy of mine. Mom and dad didn't know it. And apparently there was a robbery involved and it was hard to get back home. Now this was either probably by train back then. It would have been 1868, thereabouts, when I was 10 or 12 years old. And it was quite an adventure. Later, as I got close to 17, I was able to take a trip to the northern waters, the boundary waters up in Minnesota, which uh, was quite unknown at that time to go that far. And it was an adventure that also added knowledge to me about protecting the waterways, how beautiful nature is, and what the heavens gave us for a world to live in. Towards the end of my time in South Haven, I uh, was recognized by my stepmother and her advocacy for higher education and my teacher in secondary school, I never graduated high school, but my secondary teacher said, wow, you're a pretty smart whippersnapper. So between the two of them, they allowed, they, they convinced my father to allow me to learn Latin they said, why do you want to learn Latin? I had already learned about plants. I was becoming a botanist. All the plants are named in Latin. I'd like to learn Latin so I know what the words mean. So uh, my teacher, I think uh, Julia Fields, taught me Latin. Then we got permission from my father that I could read Darwin's book on the origin of species. That was controversial in 1868, right now, I think, uh, because a lot of the uh, advocacy that Darwin made kind of contradicts the religious background that my father had. But being a fairly open minded person, he allowed me to read the book, and that even increased my thirst for knowledge in science and Bible. As time went on, I advocated to leave the farm and go to Michigan Ag College in Lansing. Some of you may not know that name. I was a Spartan before they were Spartans because Michigan Ag College at that time, of course, was one of the first, if not the first, land grant college in the United States. And that becomes important a little later in some of my contributions that I've made. So there at Michigan Ag College, I started studying. All of a sudden, um, there was a young woman who caught my eye and we started to get friendly. And her father was also involved of agriculture, but more on the protein production. He was a, uh, a beef, a cow raiser, beef raiser, uh, successful. And otherwise, of course, his daughter wouldn't be at university, college, sorry. Uh, maybe that's why I got the name Cow College for some of us. But anyway, at Michigan Ag College. Uh, we ended up getting married and she became the mother of my children. We uh, stayed in, East Lansing for about four years as a professor. I was a professor there for four years after graduation. And then we packed up and I was hired away to go to uh, Harvard University to work for my uh, 
idol is a grave. He was the leader at the time in Bat. About this time when I got there, of course, what happens often in academia, we had a little disagreement on some of the things the professor was advocating. And what I was learning as perhaps a more inquisitive, understanding student who wants to learn more and say, wait, what was done in the past may not be correct. Maybe there's a better way to categorize this. Um, after two years, it was time to leave. Um, and I was recruited into Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And while I was there in the beginning, I created the uh, horticulture department. Now, what is horticulture? Horticulture is a term that was created around that time, which is the combination of botany and agriculture. And you add the two together because agriculture was to grow things for financial, well, first of all, of course, for food. But number two, people went into the farming industry to feed the family, first of all, but also as a source of income. So that was a business, agriculture. On the other side, botany was the study of plants, how to make plants more productive and more valuable. So the horticulture is the result of adding agriculture and botany together to create this whole new area that picks up the slack between the two and helps commercialize how to gain knowledge and put it to use to both generate food for the people and also monetary reward for the farmer. Now today, of course, that remains a big challenge out there in egg, how to maximize the sustenance farmer so they can continue to feed the world. The big initiative, of course, is how to feed 10 billion people in 2050. If you haven't heard about that, that's it's a serious issue, and it's even been shortened now given some of the global issues that we're facing today. But with that, at Cornell, I ended up becoming the dean of the horticulture school. That's where I really made my name and my comments. We go back to my days at, top, at uh, Ag College. I said I would divide my life into three phases. The first one was the learning phase. It started in South Haven, it continued in Lansing, and I would say I learned some things at Harvard. Second phase was the labor phase. Most of the labor in my life that was compensated was in Ithaca, New York at Cornell. There, I taught many classes. I wrote numerous books. I edited hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts for people and became co-authors on those. And I earned a very respectable living out there. There are buildings with my name. There are uh, laboratories. I had a beautiful home on the lake there because I could afford it. We had meetings there. Students would come out, other professors. And it was a real think tank and gorgeous on the west side of, I believe, Lake Cayuga. Uh, during those years, I learned and taught an awful lot to a lot of people. Now, if we go back, because this is passport for the time, when mom died at the age of 12, and I developed a speech impediment, one of the gentlemen in South Haiti that my father had met, who was also a fruit grower, took me under his wing and worked with me and convinced me at the age of 15 to write and deliver a paper to the Michigan State Homological Society at the age of 15. I think I remember going to Lansing for that presentation, but that process helped me get over the speech impediment. I went on and I've given hundreds of lectures around the world about horticulture and botany. 
And I attribute that to a gentleman. Some of you may know his name. If you've ever gone over the blue drawbridge in South Haven, the bridge was named after him, the Dykeman Bridge. And I owe so much of my education and my prosperous presentations to Mr. Dykeman. We have other people of influence in the museum, but we'll go back to it. So as, as we neared the end of my labor phase, I retired from Cornell in 1917, I believe, at the age of 55. Good pension program. You get out of university at 55 with a lot of things ahead of you. This is now my leisure phase. One of the first trips I made was to China. Now, in 1917, Anglos from New York had not really been to China an awful lot or get their safety. So I sailed across the Pacific with my wife, my daughter Ethel, and a Jesuit priest who promised to speak the language and keep us alive. We got there to China. After being there for a little bit, hanging around, looking at plants, I left my wife and daughter at a monastery that was sanctioned by the Jesuit priest. And we went up the Yangtze River, a thousand miles up the river in 19, probably by now like 1918, because it takes a while to get to China on a boat. Uh, and there's written documents from my return where he, I collected dozens of new specimens took samples of them and photographed I didn't mention that earlier, but I was a very, very early advocate of using photography to document horticulture and botany. Um, we have a replica camera that Bailey used. It's not the exact one that's at Cornell on display, but this is the exact same model. And we have some of Bailey's original glass plates that he took and created. So he was a very early advocate of using photographic documentation to prove your hypothesis. Because you can't argue too often with photos. Nowadays you can because of all the opportunities to change them. But back then, if you had it on paper and you had the leaf pressed in paper and you had the seeds with you, um, the story was pretty compelling. And that was one of my contributions to science, the botany and horticulture. So after coming back from China, I was still in the traveling days because I was young. Imagine, let's say a couple of years, so I come back at 57, you know, I can't remember all of this because I'm now, I think, 164, uh, given the time when I was born, but I try and I have some good resources to refresh my memory. Then I started circling the world looking for palms. One of my most memorable trips was to Venezuela, looking for palms with my daughter. I forget how many we collected. Fortunately, I've got several pictures somebody took of us on the beach with a palm tree, you know, collecting samples. And uh, it was really, really enjoyable and also still adventuresome. These continuous travels generated a nickname for me. As some of you are young enough to know, the Indiana Jones of Botany because I did not refuse to go anywhere to try to advance the science of botany and horticulture. And uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience to do so. That's the picture of us at the wall in China with the Jesuit priest, myself, perhaps different than my wife and my daughter at home. Here we are before we left Venezuela on the beach, sailboat that we used to move around the island and collect specimens. 
It was a lovely trip. The last one that I took with my dog. As I continued to travel around the globe, I worked towards trying to get to every country, trying to expand the knowledge base I had and the ability to collect specimens and expand the knowledge base here in the state. Many of those have come back. Um, there are some growing in the Bailey Garden in South Haven. Uh, one of our guests yesterday asked, well, did any of them turn out to be invasive? And my only answer is probably, <laughs> because I don't know. And, and, uh, we, you know. It's a question that they ask, and so I will try to find an answer for that. And I'd be surprised was not the case. I mean, you take a ship over and you get invasive species. But, um, one of the regrets when I was 91 years old, one time ago, I was in a bank in New York and I slipped and fell on the marble. It was wet and uh, broke my leg or hip, I don't remember. Uh, and they came to help me. And at the time, in my jacket pocket, I had tickets to Africa. I had never been to Africa. So my mission was to get to Africa, the last continent that I had not been to. I had the tickets in my pocket. I had the money in my pocket because I was going to the bank to get the money to go to Africa. And unfortunately, I still haven't recovered enough to ever make it there. But that was, uh, one of the disappointments for the next seven years, uh, five years, 91, 92, yeah, uh, five years of my life that I, I couldn't travel anymore. Right? You can imagine at the age of 91, 92, recovering from a broken leg or hip isn't very easy and often is not successful. Even at a younger age, it can be debilitating. Many of you know people who have suffered from late age. So um, we continued along, taught, enjoyed life. It was really great in upstate New York. As the video mentioned, I couldn't make it to the dedication of the museum, but it was really a great event when my roommate's widow bought the building and turned it and dedicated it to the museum. At one of my going away parties, and I don't usually work from script, as you may tell, but I want to keep a couple things accurate. And this is part of the test, so bear with me. Talk about that though. A global traveler for 40 years travels to collect, catalog, and document plant species around the globe, all the third part of my defined structured life. When I lived to 96, the leisure phase was bigger than the learning and labor phase. So I was very fortunate in that regard to have so much leisure time. During that leisure time, I was recruited by Teddy Roosevelt, the president, to help rural agriculture. This is one of my several great non-scientists to the world. First, I believe the first one that I advocated was the electrification of farms. Get electricity out of the city, get it to the farms so they could put machines in there and, and the kids on the farms could do more valuable work than the, the, the machines could do, right? Because if you only have 10 kids on a farm, and they're all doing something, if you get a machine, all of a sudden they, five of them can probably do something else. So you can be far more productive. So that was one of the initiatives under, I think it's the Country Life uh, Program. I, I forget the name because it's been so long. Uh, so that was one of the initiatives that I championed under the direction of President Roosevelt. Uh, second of all, 
postal service. Until I advocated the expanded postal service to the farms, people were cut off. Today, the discussion is a lot of farms don't have internet, right? But back then, farms didn't have mail service. So that led to the expansion of the postal service. Now, many of you may know postal, post offices that have closed. I think the one in Glen has been converted, right? Because that was a small post office that can't sustain itself. So many of them. But at the time, it was critical for the growth of the agricultural industry to expand the postal service. So the people on the farms, number one, could communicate if they wanted to send information out. And number two, they could read, perhaps two weeks late, but read what's going on in the world. And that was a really big step. And that was my suggestion to President Roosevelt. The third one that actually was before I retired at Cornell, I was a chief advocate very early to hire women in the academic world on their merit. And I think if you look, Cornell is one of the first leading universities to employ smart, talented female professors. And I advocated that early on in my tenure there. And I, not after I retired, but I think of the things I've done and they come back. 4-H uh, club. So all the kids who go to 4-H today, that's the program for youth out in the rural areas to learn about husbandry, agriculture, and horticulture was created by my recommendation so that we can educate the next generation of farmers. Because back, even today, but back then, the key was how do we grow more food to feed the burgeoning urban populations? You know, because the farms were still out the country much further than they are now, because now the urban developments have come up to the farms, which has created political issues. That's a different story. Um, and so by helping the kids learn how to farm effectively, they were able to help the family farms maintain sustainability and stay alive and produce more food for the, the population in the city. Uh, the last one, which is near and dear to many people in Michigan and around the globe now, uh, I helped create the extension program. Michigan State Extension, I believe, was the first one in the nation. It's probably Michigan Ag College Extension. Uh, but the key was, all of these people are educated. Let's put them to work helping other people. And that's what led to the creation of the Extension Program. The Extension Program has now been implemented, I believe, in every land grant college in the country and in other countries, because it's been so effective to take all this trained knowledge and, and resources and share it. Yes, they're funded you know, by tax dollars. However, I believe data will show that the yield is exponential considering the cost of the researchers who are now working for extension. We have one extension member on our board at the Bailey right now, uh, just recruited a second one who specializes in small fruit production. So she takes care of the blueberry and gray, cranberry, some apple people and all that stuff. A uh, nice young woman who's uh, taken for the end of her first year. But that was something that I'm very proud of because it has continued and expanded. Part of the video mentioned it, but you know, one of the first research stations for MSU, even before it was MSU, it was the fruit research station in South Haven. I thought I heard it before I walked in. And uh, it became an MSU extension until it became, it became too valuable. But there are several MSU extension facilities. One I saw on the way back from Allegan on the horse today coming here uh, north of South Haven. There's a lovely one in Novi, Michigan called Holgate. And I'm hoping that very soon uh, Bailey will have a presence there. A side note. I was stopped in, talked to them, three people of authority, never heard of Bailey. So I hope to change that, all right? Because I was offended. <laughs> <laughs> so those were the major significant contributions 
that I take credit for. So um, I would like to close with a couple of comments. And uh, one of these was mentioned at celebration of one of my birthdays. And it wasn't written by me, it was by one of my admirers. Uh, a student of life, a global horticulturist, an educator, a philosopher, a poet, a photographer, an artist, a social change pioneer and advocate, explorer today, most importantly, an environmentalist. And if everybody practiced what I incorporated into my infamous book, The Holy Earth, the world would be on a different path because of what I learned from the Potawatomi, what I learned in the field. And that's a book that everybody who cares about the earth, the future, and agriculture uh, should get. We happen to have uh, the 100th anniversary edition at the museum. As he was called on his 90th birthday, my 90th birthday at Cornell, a humanist, broad reaching, touching all facets of life, and caring about humanity. And I'm the least known self of South Haven. <laughs> so in 1955, at one of the tributes at Cornell, and it was uh, after I slipped and fell and passed away from another world, George Lawrence wrote, he was charitable, I was charitable to fellow man to a fault. And even in my last years, he was understanding of my professional critics, open-minded, embracing, encouraging, but open, you know, still understanding. I looked for good in the world. I lived a good life. Some say I died on Christmas Day, 1954. I don't know. I have one more part, and then if any of you have questions, on his 90th birthday, what I said on my 90th birthday, it is a marvelous planet on which we ride. It is a great privilege to live there, to partake in the journey, and to experience its goodness. We may cooperate rather than rebel. We should try to find the meanings rather than to be, to be satisfied only with the spectacles. My life has been a continuous fulfillment of dreams. I hope this background gives you um, more information about me and, and Liberty Bailey and how he contributed to the world. The more I learn, the more I get engaged. If the world, he, my teachings and philosophies, a lot of problems would be solved environmentally and with the food chain and feeding the growing population. How to feed 10 billion people in 28 years is a challenge. And that's a global challenge. And if anybody don't know, if any of you don't know about it, look it up. 2050 is the, the term they're using. And it would help slow the destruction of the Earth's um, resources and our livability. With that, I want to thank you very much. Um, I'll take questions. My last comments now as chair of the board at the Bailey Museum. <laughs> No longer Liberty High <laughs> I'm Dan Williamson. I am chair of the board of the Bailey Museum, which I'm very happy to have been roped into. It's been enjoyable for the last few years. Uh, and I look forward to the next several. We have great aspirations in how to spread Bailey's teachings and philosophies 
not just here in West Michigan, but like Tollgate that I mentioned, the, farm, the MSU extension, and then start expanding outward. And uh, I look forward to being a key part of that. Uh, joining the museum has privileges. And uh, I tell people who come to visit, it's the best deal in town because of the reciprocity. First of all, you're supporting the museum and what we're trying to do. But we have reciprocity with hundreds of locations across the country and even in other countries. Not too far, but when uh, 15 years ago we were scuba diving in Cayman, we came across in the Queen's Garden and in Grand Cayman is on the list. So you could spend $35 at the Bailey and get in free at the Queen's Garden in Cayman. So that's quite a deal. We don't pay for Erica. Uh, <laughs> Lastly, well, maybe not lastly, but uh, we have our fourth Bailey Fall Conference coming up in uh, September, later this month, September 30th. And then we have our third Ag Tour on Saturday, October 1st. So please go to the website. It's pretty easy to find, libertyhighbailey.org. Uh, and find the details, and I hope you know because we have a nice list of very great speakers, uh, keynote speakers, Heather Holm from Minnesota. Uh, you can see the biography. I try not to remember and you know, memorize all that stuff, uh, but please join us and uh, we hope to see you there. And I guess lastly, in addition to being uh, chair of the board, I come from a family who loves history. In 1979, my parents bought a 150-year-old dairy barn. And it was on the homestead in Northville, Michigan, called the Samuel White Homestead. The, 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 uh, the homestead house was a lot like the Bailey Museum, built in 1827, about 27 years before the Bailey House. People moved west. Right? So very similar, and that was restored. I just didn't own that. They owned the barn, turned it into a house, renovated it. I uh, had the, li uh, the liberty to <laughs> dig 18 inches of blue clay out of the basement to make the basement tall enough for people to walk in because it was built for cows, right? And it had to break out the, the cement water troughs. Um, but that was very nice, lovely house. Uh, got married there and outdoor wedding. They had reduck the pond and stocked it with fish because it had overgrown. So that was one historical. Then we uh, bought uh, Stephen Jennings' house, which was also built around that time, and bought it from Boston Hospital, if any of you know Detroit, the hospital in Redford, Michigan. So we bought that and picked it up and moved it about uh, 12 miles Farmington Hills and renovated it. Both of them are now a historic site. So, uh, Beautiful to continue the tradition of protecting history. As my brother and sister said, dad would be proud. <laughs> so with that, any questions from any of you out here? Um, what are the days and times and admission prices if someone wants to come out and visit the museum? Well, if anybody wants to come and visit us, since we're into the fall and end of season, uh, we're trying to keep the website posted. Uh, we're down to Saturdays and by appointment in advance. And it's my mobile that's posted because I'm most accessible and also give the best tools. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, admission is zero dollars. But donations uh, are welcome. It, the, the donations are welcome. And we also have some of Bailey's books and other books reflecting Bailey's philosophies in the gift shop. Uh, we also host several different events uh, and groups are going to come as well. Uh, we are in the middle of an art exhibit for a young artist, Kayla Ridley, who has done several of the really big award-winning murals in the South Haven and buildings. So that's going to be presented until October 2. Um, we finished a couple others earlier this year. Uh, there will be more events, so please keep an eye on the website. Uh, because we want to continue to bring people in and share it with them and also use this wonderful space to be.
Well, Dan, thank you so much for coming all the way down to Berrien Springs and sharing um, Bailey's story and these, these wonderful impacts he made. Um, I think what we forget when we're in our small towns and our hometowns is that sometimes the impact of our neighbors are a lot further than we imagine them. So Liberty Hyde Bailey was a big voice from a very small town that impacted the world. So he, he certainly did. And, uh, we look forward to continuing to spread wider and wider with his reach and influence in well, thank you everyone who showed up tonight online and in person. It will be available on our YouTube page for those who are watching this later. You should be able to access it. But if you want to spread the word, please do so. You can find us online at BarianHistory.org, or you can just go to YouTube and look up Berrien County Historical Association. Um, and you can also check out past videos from other talks, including uh, women's history, Berrien County history, and a lot more. So thank you so much.